¿Qué tal comunidad? Aquí habla su abogado Ray Ibarra Maldonado. Como siempre, un gusto. Hoy estamos hablando primero en inglés y después en español. Ladies and gentlemen, getting the party started in English tonight. We got two amazing guests we have with us to talk about what's going on in the great state of Georgia. I'll get them up here on the screen in just a second. So a very special show that we have. Uh, Basim Fakuri, who is live in Georgia, local activist in Georgia, and the amazing Erica Andiola, who will be giving us the national picture on why Georgia is so important. So do me a huge favor, give us that share, give us a like, throw a comment, any questions you have, throw those in there as well. But let's get it started because we really need people to learn about what's going on in Georgia, how to get involved, why it means so much. Share this video and we will get the party started. So with us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have the huge pleasure of having two awesome people. Basim Fakuri is a local activist in Georgia, out of Roswell, Georgia, the political center of the universe right now, the great state of Georgia. Basim, thanks so much for being on. My pleasure, Ray. Thank you for having me. Of course. And we have with us tonight the world famous, I, I saw someone post today, <laughs> 2019 Glamour Woman of the Year celebration she was at. You've seen her on CNN. You see her frequently on MSNBC. She's currently the political affairs coordinator for Raices. You can correct me if I got that wrong, uh, but uh, she really needs no introduction to the audience here. Miss Erica Andiola. Erica, thanks so much. I know you're extremely busy. Thanks for making the time. I know we're not CNN, MSNBC, but you still get on for us anyways. <laughs> really appreciate it, Erica. No, thank you for inviting me. I can never, never say no to you, Ray. Awesome, appreciate that. And <laughs> let's get the folks informed. So Erica, if you can tell us, why is Georgia, why are we talking about Georgia? You're, you're Arizona, I'm Arizona. We got a local Georgia guy here, but why is Georgia important in the national picture here? Yeah, for sure. Well, I, you know, definitely this is from a perspective of someone who is from Arizona and uh, from a perspective of, of, you know, someone who is really invested in the in the immigrant rights uh, struggle and, and making sure that we are moving forward with policies that are progressive, but that are also humane uh, for our communities. And so to us, um, one of the very important um, when something that was very important from the election is that we were able to see um, and we were able to defeat, you know, someone like Donald Trump um, and that we now um, have the ability to push our agenda in a very different way than we did under the Trump administration. And we all, we all knew, right, like we have any any power or you know, we maybe very, very little, almost no power under the Trump administration to push for pro-immigrant from pro, a pro-immigrant pro agenda. Um, now under Biden, because he has such a different approach, because he has such a different promise on immigration, we can push him uh, for what we want. Um, but if we're not winning um, the Senate for Democrats, um, it's going to be really hard to pass something in Congress. And you have all seen that. Uh, for many years, we have tried to pass something, you know, that's uh, a path to citizenship or anything else that would support our immigrant community in Congress. And um, we, we haven't been able to do it in years. I mean, the last time we were so close to something was the DREAM Act in 2010, and even that failed. And so if, you know, Democrats don't gain the Senate back, we're going to have even less power to push them uh, to pass something through the legislature. Um, and so right now we do have some, um, you know, uh, a possibility of, of, of doing that through Georgia. Uh, but I won't, I won't talk a lot more because I know we have somebody from Georgia here. Uh, but to me, it's definitely something that we have to be all looking out for and also uh, providing our support to our uh, sisters, brothers and, and community members there in, in the state. Thank you so much, Erica. That's exactly what we wanted to do tonight. Bossom, please, you know, let us here in Arizona those watching in Texas, our friends in Mississippi, uh, across the country, let us know what's going on in Georgia. Just give us uh, the 100 level recap for us, if you could, please. Sure. So in Georgia this year, we actually have two Senate races uh, that are going into a runoff. And the reason for that is basically one senator uh, retired 
and a uh, governor who is a Republican named uh, another person to fill out his term. And then the second Senate race uh, was due to happen this year. And uh, both Senate races are now uh, going into a runoff. Uh, in Georgia, if uh, nobody gets above the 50% mark plus one vote, it automatically goes to a runoff. And so uh, I think the numbers for the, the senator against Ossoff was like at 49.8 or 49.6. So that triggered a runoff automatically. Uh, the second race uh, we knew was going to into a runoff because there were like nine people or 12 people involved. So there was no way for one single person to get to that 50% mark and, and get it uh, right away. Um, the groups here in Georgia had had been preparing for at least one runoff, but I don't think anybody anticipated the fact that the whole Senate uh, would be in the balance based on what's gonna happen in January. Uh, so right now we are uh, preparing, uh, we're starting basically from scratch in terms of uh, getting out the vote. Uh, we're trying to, um, one interesting thing that happened is a lot of people started calling and, and said, oh, my God, uh, I really want to vote now. Uh, and we're like, where were you, you know, three weeks ago? <laughs> and yeah. so there's a, a huge push to get a lot of people who uh, either forgot to vote or never bothered to vote to, to get registered. And the deadline for that, I believe, is um, December 5th or December 7th. I'm sorry. Uh, there's also uh, an interesting number. There's about 20,000 young people who are 17 right now that will turn 18 come January 5th. And so mm -hmm. these young people will actually uh, also be uh, able to register at this stage. And then we'll, we'll go from there with, you know, huge, huge push. Uh, Arizona would, would welcome your help, but I can also tell you that everybody else around the country uh, have uh, switched gears uh, either from the uh, national campaigns or from their own local campaigns uh, across the country. Awesome, and, and that's why Boston's here tonight giving us that info, giving us that 411 on how we can get plugged in in just a moment. But before we get to that, Erica, if you can bring it back again. So the question really is, if it's just a Biden presidency and we don't get the Senate, will we get immigration reform Will we get a DREAM Act? What do you think? Mm. It's just it's just so much harder. And not, not only just so much harder, but it's also we have to look at the types of policies, the types of laws that are going to be pushed, you know, when you have Republicans um, who are in control of the Senate. And what we have seen in the past is that when you push uh, immigration reform through Congress, when Republicans are still in control of any of the chambers, that there's a lot of compromise that has to happen uh, from, from the Democratic side, right? And so um, if Democrats are saying, we need a path to citizenship for 11 million people, Republicans might say, okay, we'll give you this path to citizenship, but you have to build more detention centers, or you need to put more money at the border, you know, for more military to to, to be uh, sent to, to the border, uh, or have more money for, um, uh, you know, a, a digital wall now. Perhaps they're not going to build, you know, a, a physical wall, but they might want to put more technology at the border. Um, and so it's important that we have as much um, power, right, from from the Democratic side in the Senate, so that we can um, push for 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 things that don't require a compromise from uh, from Republicans. And to me, you know, it's it's just it, it's just so much more powerful to have uh, all of the chambers being controlled by the Democratic Party. Doesn't mean that they're going to give us everything easily. It's just that it, we have more leverage over them. Right. I mean, we saw that in the first uh, Obama term, right? We had it, the control. Mm -hmm. We didn't get either a DREAM Act. We didn't get immigration reform, but it makes the chances so much more likely if we're able to make that happen again. And Biden doesn't make that same mistake this time around. And Bossom, coming back to you, if you can tell us a little bit more about whether or not these two candidates have a chance to win. And I've spent the majority of the day, obviously, you know, as those of us involved here in Arizona. We've been very focused on our local races and our own races. And just today I started learning more about these two candidates. 
And you know, one of them used to work for Congressman John Lewis. Uh, the other one was the head or was head pastor at Ebenezer Baptist yeah. Church, you know, Martin Luther King's old church. And he was like, oh my God, these guys look amazing. But on the ground there, do you think they have a realistic possibility uh, of pulling it out? So to be honest with you, I'm still scratching my head how half of Georgia has, has not voted these guys in. Uh, there are amazing gentlemen. I had the pleasure of, of uh, talking to both of them. Uh, extreme uh, gentlemen, uh, very high moral standards, uh, very high ethical standards. And uh, I think the, uh, uh, I, I, I still don't understand, uh, you know, whether it's in Georgia or around the country, uh, how many people uh, are motivated to, to look uh, at somebody else. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that. And hopefully one of these days will understand the real motive behind it. But yes, absolutely. Uh, I can tell you that there's a huge groundswell uh, of work that's happening to uh, get out the vote, to register new people, to uh, learn from each other. So there's, um, in addition to the group that I belong to, which is uh, more from the Muslim perspective, uh, that we, the, the Islamic community get, come, came together after the, the Muslim ban. Uh, a lot of the people in our community are African American, so that's the second whammy. A lot of half of them are women. That's the third whammy, and uh, we are working very hard with our uh, Latino uh, friends and African American friends in um, in Georgia, so that uh, our all our voices uh, are kind of. Um, come together and, and create an even a bigger uh, difference in the, in the voting and, and taking people to, uh, to vote. There's, there's going to be, again, uh, mail-in voting. Uh, there's going to be uh, early voting. And so uh, we we're hoping to, to make it happen this time. We don't have a very good record uh, historically about uh, runoffs in Georgia in terms of the Democratic Party. But I think the, uh, the energy right now uh, as demonstrated by the fact that I'm talking to people in Arizona, uh, is definitely palpable right there, right now. Uh, Bossom, you're giving me chills over here, man. The thought of all those groups coming together to stand behind two progressive candidates to get elected, to take over the Senate, to get uh, what we would wanted for so long, immigration reform, DREAM Act, and so many other things that the Democrats could do not just on the immigration agenda, but you know, across the whole platform uh, right. is just amazing, inspiring, the chance that we have to make this happen. And, and Erica, coming back to you again, um, and I don't wanna throw, you know, throw out the fire or say if, if it doesn't happen, but let's just hypothetically speaking, if, if we can't get those two seats in Georgia, what do you expect immigration wise from a Biden presidency? Yeah, no, that's a super important question. And I think the very first priority is to undo every policy that was done by the Trump administration. And I was talking to my colleagues today on how shocked I am that there were about 400 policies that we know of that were changed by the Trump administration in the four years that he was in office. 400. I mean, these are from like really, you know, sort of, uh, small policy changes that nobody knows about to big policy changes like family separation, like, you know, the Muslim ban, um, and so on and so forth, right, that a lot of us heard about. And it's important that, you know, as soon as the Biden administration comes into office, that they have a you know, priority and prioritize this through a very powerful team um, that is literally not sleeping until they get rid of every single policy. And I know I'm exaggerating here, but that's super important. And then the second part of this is that we need to ensure that just like by, uh, just like Trump had so much um, power over changing our immigration uh, system through so many executive actions, you know, really looking at what can we do from the executive side uh, with, with the Biden administration on changing the lives of the immigrant community for the better. Um, and, you know, we, <laughs> I was just telling one of my uh, colleagues today, it's like, look, I knew that someone like Steve Miller was going to sleep and waking up every day asking himself, 
how am I going to make the lives of immigrants miserable? I mean, mm -hmm. I can tell you that that was every single day he would wake up and figure out how he could make the lives of immigrants miserable. We need the opposite of that. We need people who wake up every day in the Obama, in the Biden administration thinking to themselves, how can I make the life of the immigrant community better today? Um, and so to me, that's very important. And that, you know, we could look at all the executive actions that he can take at the, under the law. And of course, if we're going to make a push in the Senate without, you know, the Democrats being in power and, and, and in the House, right, that, that we do it, but we do it strategically, that we're not doing the same thing that Obama did, that was basically like really pushing for something in the Congress and not, not doing anything through the executive and in the opposite, you know, direction, he was deporting and detaining immigrants at, at record numbers. Like we just, we, we can't go in that direction again. And Erica, just piggybacking off of that, I mean, you are the co-founder of the Arizona Dream Act Coalition. Prior to DACA, you were doing tremendous amount of work to push the executive uh, to take that executive action. What kind of actions could folks take, other than we're going to talk more about voting and getting involved in Georgia, but what kind of action or organizing should be going on uh, for young people or anybody that's interested in immigrants' rights to push the executive uh, to do more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, I was uh, reviewing the immigration platform that Biden had on, on his website. And it's, I can tell you that the work that immigrant right activists have been doing is reflected on that. There's a lot of great stuff in there, right? They, you know, he's already promising a lot of the stuff that we want to see. Um, you know, examples are, you know, working to undo all the, the Trump policies. Um, but he's also talking about detention and uh, in deportations and a moratorium on deportations and so on and so forth. And so to me, it's important that we start seeing what are the changes that he's going to be making on, for example, detention centers, right? He says he's going to end private detention centers. I think for me, it's, it's important that he starts looking uh, closer into how can we get rid of immigrant immigrant detention like we didn't have that years ago why do we have to have that now um and really being more creative around solutions to to how can we ensure that we're not criminalizing and detaining and deporting the immigrant community as we saw in the obama administration right and so looking at at, at that um and also proactive ways to expand things like deferred action right deferred action was given to to, to daca recipients um but there's nothing that's stopping them from, from ensuring that there's more and more people who might not necessarily qualify for DACA under the law, of course, right? That's not being challenged, that can be um, expanded to more people uh, that outside of just the dreamers. And so, you know, I can go on and on, but it's just really when there's the will where there's, there's what's the saying? I, I'm thinking that in Spanish, but yeah, if they have the will to do things. And there's the will, there's uh, the way. They, there it is. That's the English version of it. Um, and, and, and I think it's important, again, to start with the right team and the people who are going to be waking up every day to making sure that this, this is, these are policies that, um, you know, that we can put into place. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. We definitely want right? to get the right team in there. Yeah, boss, I'm going can for I, it. Man. Can I ask Erica a quick question? Go for it, brother. Yeah. Okay. So uh, every time I talk to either Ossoff or uh, Reverend Warnock, I ask them how they're going to be able to, to effect change in the Senate. And they both promise that one of the things that they're going to try to do is actually reach out to the other side of the aisle and, and try to work with these folks. Do, do you think there's a chance any of that is going to change anytime soon? Or is the Senate, the senators going to continue to dig in into their uh, sides. This is where, in, you know, my sense of this and, and one of the reasons why I have been working so much with Ray, you know, and, and the uh, activist community here in Arizona is that a lot of what can happen within, with the Democrats, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I, you know, I'm not feeling optimistic that it's not going to happen okay. without us, without us pushing. Um, and, and I think there is, you know, I, I, I do think that there's some Democrats who really believe that there should be more enforcement uh, at the border, that there should be more detention centers, that there should be more deportations. Um, it, and it's going to be up to us, you know, to, to really organize and mobilize so that we can be pushing them like we pushed Obama, right? Obama didn't want to do DACA. He didn't want to do it. 
we mobilized, we organized, and we were able to push them to, you know, to get it done. So it's going to take a lot of a lot of work from us. Um, but I can tell you that I think we are more likely to push a Democrat than we are to push a, a Republican who's running on, on time on an anti-immigrant agenda. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Erica. I mean, you, you hit it home there. It's like uh, just because it's a Democrat in office, we can't just sit back and assume they're going to start doing the right things and the things that we expect. We have to keep the fire on them. We have to keep organizing. We have to keep being public and, and demanding the changes that we that we want to see. Um, and we hopefully that we have the Senate to be able to do that so they don't have the excuse of, well, we don't have one chamber, so we can't do it. Uh, so getting back to that, Bossom, how can us here in Arizona or folks across the country plug in or support the work that you guys are doing down there in Georgia? So uh, we have a couple of very good organizations on the Islamic side that I'm the most familiar with. Uh, the one is the Georgia Muslim Voter Project. Uh, this is a nonpartisan group that is focused on uh, getting people to sign up uh, and register to vote and then uh, you know, working with them to get out the vote and make sure that they do that. The second one is the Council on American Islamic Relationship of Georgia, CARE, C-A-I-R. Uh, those have announced a, uh, a first of a kind, you know, joint effort to to really uh, go out after uh, everybody that they can work with. Uh, I mentioned earlier that they are also part of a bigger uh, collection of uh, minority uh, groups that are working together, including the um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice uh, Fund that is has been working a lot. And um, so that's that's on the side of the activism. Uh, these are C3 and C4 organizations. Um, separate from that, there's a totally uh, different uh, line of work that's happening with the community itself, the Muslim community itself, uh, in um, partnership with other uh, minority communities, including, by the way, uh, a lot of the uh, rabbis and the Jewish communities in, in Georgia as well. Uh, we're working with them, uh, as well as a lot of uh, churches and, and uh, you know, different uh, Catholic groups. So uh, there's if, if people want to work directly with the campaign, uh, they can, uh, I'll send you more information after we hang up here so you can put it in your, uh, in the in the notes. Uh, but Definitely. if they want to work directly with the campaigns, there's there's a path to do that. And if they want to work uh, sort of behind the scenes uh, to support these candidates, uh, there's another way of doing that. And here legally in Georgia, as you probably know, the two have to be totally separate. Uh, mm -hmm. the people that can do like uh, separate expenditures cannot uh, be seen with the campaigns at all or be in touch with the campaigns at all. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks, Bossom. And for those of you watching, we, we will compile uh, all the information Bossom saying the organization so you can reach out to them. We have a page dedicated just to a bunch of stuff we've gotten from different groups and organizations on how to get involved in Georgia. We'll post that in the comments uh, here in just a minute. So you can go there, you can text, you can call, you can physically go, you can donate money. There's just nine million ways. And in the 21st century, there's no excuse to not do something you don't have pandemic i don't want to leave my house i totally understand there's things you can do sending postcards sending text messages uh social media work that you can get this information out there as well so we'll put the link down there we'll get some comments to get to here folks patty serrano says demand the changes we deserve and need and that's a deserve in all caps and a need in all caps definitely agree with that patty erica you got thoughts on that Yeah, we got to demand what we what we believe is the right the right thing to do for the American community. And, you know, I'm seeing some of the other comments and um, I, you know, that we got to give Biden a chance. I, I agree. I think we have, you know, we're starting, hopefully, you know, might be that we're starting fresh and, and that might be the, the reality. Um, and I, I do believe that there is a difference between antagonizing and and pushing, you know, to, to antagonize and, 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 and holding accountable and accountability. And I think accountability has to happen with every person who runs for office. No, it doesn't matter if it's like your, your best friend running, right? Once they get elected, 
there has to be that accountability as an elected official to follow through with their promises. Um, and so at least from, you know, from my perspective and the perspective of the, of the organization that I work with, we want to be able to, to have that accountability. Um, and, you know, that can look in different ways. That can be, you know, us pushing for the people we want to see in his leadership. Um, you know, that can be um, ensuring that there's the, the right policies that we are presenting to them, right, that we want. And then eventually, yeah, I mean, we, we have to go out and protest and we have to go out and, and, and pressure in different ways and use different tactics. And we're going to have to do that. Uh, but I think that accountability in one way or another is important uh, so that we're not in the same position that we ended up with, you know, like I said, in, in the Obama administration where there was very little accountability and we ended up with more deportations um, than we ended up with an immigration reform bill. So um, absolutely, I think we can do both. Awesome, thank you so much. This, this country uh, has all the rights kind of guarantees for, for everyone, but they're not never given on a silver platter. You, you do have to go and, and ask for them and demand them. But they're, they're guaranteed, but they're not gonna be given to you. Nobody's gonna say, hey, you forgot to ask for them. And so uh, demand is, is the right word, I think, for what needs to happen next. Exactly, totally agree. And we might have to do that same thing so we can get the keys, right? Uh, who knows what Trump's gonna do, but we first might have to be doing the kind of actions we're talking about just so we can get Biden power so then we can begin holding him accountable and making these things happen. Uh, and Aaron's saying, Aaron's ready for a road trip here. Would be great to go and physically help. We need all support in Georgia. Aaron is ready to gas up the jet and head on out to the great state of Georgia and help out there. Uh, we'll Rosemary. welcome you with open arms. There you go, you got it. Bossom stay in, Aaron, you're welcome. Uh, so let's make it happen. We've got Rosemary sharing a link as well and saying promises, promises we can't stop, won't stop, indeed, most definitely. Anybody else has comments, concerns, opinions, throw them down there in the comments. We'll address them. I want to get Nancy's comment up here that she said earlier, too. We cannot be a House Senate divided. Yes, I agree. We have to push for President Biden to undo the horrific damage to immigrants, but immigrants who are violent criminals must be deported and detained. Yeah, and, and I think not, Biden's not going to need pressuring on that, right? Um, he's going to need pressuring, though, on what happened to the folks in Mississippi that were detained and separated from their families, uh, what happened to Guadalupe. Um, and Garcia Rios that was uh, removed from this country, all the things that Trump did wrong, the people that he's keeping in Mexico not applying for asylum, we're going to have to push him on that stuff uh, to make sure he undoes all those wrongs that President Trump did. And you know the, the other part there, he, he's going to keep doing that. Record number of deportations under the Obama administration, nobody has to push him to, to make that happen, that's for sure. Yeah, and we're um, not going to ask for anything that's illegal or, or, or different, right? We both as minorities need to ask for what, what to be treated equally. And, and mm -hmm. as long as we continue to do that, nobody can hold that against us. Most definitely. And we're just about to wrap up our English portion here. If anybody has any questions or comments, please get them down. We're going to switch to Spanish in a few minutes. Bossom understands un poco de español. Uh, but not completely bilingual. So if you, yeah, un poquito. <laughs> um, but so if you have any questions for him, you know, what's going on locally in Georgia or how to plug in locally, again, we can get you guys connected later, but go ahead and drop them down in the comments right now. Um, if not, we will switch over to Espanol. And Bossom, again, I know you had multiple requests to be speaking with people tonight. Really, really thank you for taking the time uh, to come and, and speak with us about what's going on in your state of Georgia and we look forward to continuing to be in contact. And any other way we can support you, anything we can do, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. You know, in Arizona, we've seen a lot of people fly in, do a press conference, take off, never come back. Uh, so, so we learned that you know, from our own experiences the past 10 plus years fighting for immigrants' rights. So whatever in Georgia y'all are doing that we can support and we can push the work that you've been doing for years over there, just let us know we got your back, all right? Appreciate it, Ray. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, we're going to need your, your help and your prayers more even, more importantly. So hopefully this will, uh, this will happen. Most definitely. You got that. Take care, Boston. Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye now. Okay. Ya andamos hablando en español. 
Los que están aquí, uh, dice Rosemary, hi, Erica. Ya es español, Rosemary, si ya es hola, Erica. Hola. Uh, Erica, <laughs> si usted nos puede explicar por qué está tan importante Georgia, por qué estamos hablando de Georgia. Uh -huh. Sí, mira, es, es muy importante porque ahorita tenemos una situación donde ya, ya sabemos que Trump ya, ya se va, ¿no? No quiere irse, pero se, se tiene que ir. Eh, ya tenemos un nuevo presidente eh, que va a empezar en el próximo año. Y es un demócrata, es Biden, eh, y tiene muchísimas uh, propuestas que son pro inmigrantes y ha dicho, ¿no?, de que quiere hacer todo lo posible para poder uh, cambiar la, la vida de los inmigrantes en este país. Ahora, para nosotros poder empujar algo por medio del Congreso, uh, tenemos que tener más poder en, en, los, en los dos, ¿no? En el Senado y en la Cámara de Representantes. Desafortunadamente ahorita eh, los demócratas tienen eh, poder en la Cámara de Representantes, pero no es el mismo poder que se tiene en el Senado, ¿no? Entonces los republicanos están en el poder ahí. Y ahorita Georgia, lo que pueden lo que puede pasar es de que si los dos senadores que están corriendo para, eh, para el Senado en Georgia, si ellos llegaran a, llegaran a ganar a los demócratas, eh, se puede cambiar el poder completamente, ¿no? Entonces, eh, ahorita McConnell, que es el, el líder del Senado, que es un republicano, ya no sería el líder, ya sería uno de los demócratas, ¿no? Ahora, eso no, no nos garantiza que va a haber una reforma migratoria, no nos garantiza que, que vaya a haber algo pro-inmigrante, pero si sí nos hace llegar un poquito más, nos da más poder, ¿no? Porque tenemos mucho más poder nosotros para empujar a los demócratas que para empujar a los republicanos. Y para empujar, no quiero decir que vamos a ir a, a gritarles, de, luego, luego, que vamos a ir a, a, a hacer los enemigos, no. Simplemente que tenemos más uh, herramientas para tener, eh, no sé cómo se dice accountability en español, pero yo creo que es como para... Eh, pues para pedirles lo que nosotros necesitamos porque ellos están eh, corriendo con esas promesas, ¿no? Entonces, eh, sí, necesitamos esas dos, esas dos posiciones que ganen los demócratas en, en Georgia y si eso llegara a pasar tuviéramos muchísimo más oportunidad de pasar algo pro inmigrante por medio del Senado y por medio de la Cámara de Representantes y ahora ya tenemos un presidente demócrata, ¿no? Entonces, eh, pues da mucho más esperanza. Mm. So estamos hablando de política 101 para que todos entiendan bien. Gracias, Erika, por explicar por qué es tan importante ganar los dos citas sí, sí, que tiene ahí en Georgia para que podamos tener chance de una reforma migratoria que hemos esperado por tanto tiempo uh, una reforma. Y, y tanto gente que yo tengo que hablar cada día diciendo, uh, tengo 20 años aquí, tiene 30 años aquí, tengo hijos aquí, cuentas de banco, negocios, todo y no hay camino de arreglar. Y posiblemente si podemos ganar Georgia, como dije Erika, no es garantizado, ¿verdad? Pero nos da más chance porque tenemos los demócratas en la Cámara de Representantes, ojalá el Senado, tenemos empatado 50-50. Y Erika, si ganamos los dos sillas en Georgia y es 50-50, y hay un voto por la reforma o por el Dream Act, y están empatados, los republicanos uh -huh. y los demócratas, ¿qué pasa ahí? Pues ahí es donde viene la vicepresidenta, ¿verdad? Y ahora uh -huh. ya tenemos una vicepresidenta que es eh, una mujer de color, uh, una mujer negra, que sus padres eh, son inmigrantes y pues que ha estado hablando mucho sobre sus propias um, promesas ¿no? de, de inmigración. Entonces, eh, y obviamente su nombre es Kamala Harris. Y ella sería la persona que tendría el, el último voto, el último decisión de, 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 de uh, qué puede pasar, ¿no? Entonces, ya, yeah, si iba una, una propuesta la, al Senado y los votos son 50-50, ella puede venir y, y tener el, el voto número 51. Um, entonces, hay, hay mucha, hay mucha pos posibilidad, ¿no?, para poder tener algo positivo. Puede ser que no sea una reforma migratoria integral eh, grande, ¿no?, como hemos visto en el pasado. También tal vez puede ser eh, un Dream Act, puede ser um, algo que sea más pequeño o más grande. No sabemos, ¿no?, pero que hay más posibilidad de pasar algo con eh, una mayoría de demócratas eh, es una realidad, ¿no? Porque los republicanos en este momento ya han estado muchísimo más 
eh, saliendo como antimigrantes pues por Trump y por muchas de esas cosas que han, que han dicho. Um, entonces es, es importante y ahorita estamos, tenemos que estar todos bien, bien um, atentos a lo que pasa en Georgia para saber cómo vamos a poder pelear en el 2021. Perfecto. Ya vamos a poner un link abajo donde la gente puede ir. Si usted puede ir, pues ellos están diciendo, bienvenidos, puede ir a trabajar en las dos campañas. Si no puede ir, si no quiere ir por el coronavirus, si yo entiendo, hay maneras de hacer textos, hacer llamadas, uh, mandar cartas. Hay muchas cosas, donar dinero que ustedes pueden hacer para que ayuda a esas dos personas que están corriendo, los demócratas, a ganar en contra de los republicanos. Y Erika, si usted nos puede decir, si no ganamos eh, esa elección el, el 5 de enero por los senadores en Georgia, de todos modos, ¿qué podemos esperar de, sobre migración del nuevo presidente Biden y vicepresidente Harris? Sí, mira, pues es, todo depende eh, obviamente de, del Senado, ¿no? Como tú lo dijiste, pero <risa> independientemente de lo que pase en el Senado, eh, es importante que la primera prioridad eh, que tengamos uh, bajo la administración de Biden sea que se deshagan y que um, vean todas las pólizas de inmigración que Trump ha tenido, ¿no? Bajo sus cuatro años de presidencia. Y estaba compartiendo hace rato en, en inglés que ahorita hemos estado viendo ya que son más o menos 400, 400 eh, eh, acciones que tomó Donald Trump para cambiar el sistema migratorio. Entonces, imagínense, 400 acciones que tomó para cambiar el sistema migratorio que estaban en contra de la comunidad de inmigrantes. Entonces, lo que tenemos que asegurarnos es de que lo primero que, que se haga eh, bajo la administración de Biden es de que todas esas cosas sean eh, cambiadas, ¿no? Que, 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 que regresemos, bueno, no, ni siquiera regresar a, a la normalidad que teníamos antes, sino que sean mejor. Um, y no cosas como la separación de familias en la frontera, cosas como eh, eh, no dejar que las personas que, que son musulmanes eh, puedan venir a este país, ¿no? Um, cosas, bueno, puedo, puedo hacer una lista larguísima, ¿no? Ya dije, son más o menos 400 cosas que hizo. Entonces, esa es una, una gran prioridad, pero también es importante que pueda, pueda él ver y que tenga un equipo en su administración que puedan ser creativos en cómo uno puede pasar cosas por, el, por, el, por medio de la acción ejecutiva, ¿no? Eh, que sean legales, obviamente, que no vamos a tener problemas con las cortes, pero como, vamos a decir, como la DACA, ¿no? Cuando hizo el presidente Obama la DACA, fue algo que se hizo por medio de la administración, por medio del presidente, que no se tuvo que esperar para que el Congreso hiciera algo con, con la reforma migratoria, ¿no? Entonces, hay que asegurarnos que eso sea una prioridad mientras estemos empujando todavía en el Congreso, pero que no esperemos a cambiar todo eso um, porque vamos a terminar con deportaciones, como lo hicimos la vez pasada con Obama, y no queremos que haya más deportaciones ni más eh, detenciones en el país. Perfecto. Y tenemos a Ron, que está listo ir a Georgia, también diciendo necesitamos que Biden rinda cuentas de sus promesas para nuestra comunidad. En este tema, Erika, estamos pensando que él va a decir, DACA regresa, va, va a cancelar la cancelación de DACA que hizo Trump, ojalá regresa Advance Parole, ojalá regresa que personas mm -hmm. puedan aplicar por tres años, los que entraron en, dos, en 2010, que, que amplia para más personas que uh, están en el programa de DACA. Es lo que esperamos. Mucha gente me está preguntando y quiero su opinión, ¿Qué piensas de DAPA? Si ustedes no recuerdan el programa de DAPA, es cuando los papás que tienen hijos que son ciudadanos americanos puso un programa uh, para que ellos pudieran también recibir un permiso de trabajo y promesa de no ser deportado. ¿Usted piensa que DAPA tiene una posibilidad en la administración de, de Biden? Bueno, y esta parte de la parte legal definitivamente está fuera de mi de mi comprensión, porque no, no soy abogada, pero eh, por eso te tenemos a ti, Rey. Pero, I think we, ya sabes, you, you know this well enough. Sí, no, pero es, es importante que, de nuevo, no yo pienso que sí hay posibilidades de hacer mucho, de, 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 de ver lo que se hizo con DAPA, perdón, con, con DACA, eh, con la acción de ferida y, y ser creativos en cómo la ley nos da la posibilidad para nosotros expander 
eh, lo que es DACA. Vamos a decir, por ejemplo, eh, jóvenes que vinieron antes de, 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 o más bien después, ¿no? De, de, de que DACA fue anunciado. Hay muchísimas más personas que, que vinieron después. Uh, personas como mi hermana, ¿no? Que eh, DACA, eh, cuando pasó, ella estaba un año más grande. Un año, por un año no pudo calificar para la DACA, ¿no? Entonces, para mí es importante que tan pronto como se haga una transición en la administración, que haya personas ahí adentro que tengan la pasión, que tengan la creatividad y, y que también eh, tengan la influencia en, en la administración para que puedan ellos ver ese, ese tipo de posibilidades, ¿no? Y que no nada más, de nuevo, sí queremos una reforma migratoria que nos dé un camino a la ciudadanía y no vamos a estar a gusto hasta que eso pase. Pero también hay que ver qué cosas se pueden hacer por mientras, así como, como personas como yo, no tengo un permiso de trabajo que ahorita me da la posibilidad de, de trabajar, de, eh, de manejar con, con licencia, que cuando regrese DACA, pues si Dios quiera, ¿no? que Byron lo haga, voy a poder tal vez seguir um, viajando a, a, a otros países con, la, con el Advance for Roll. Todo eso ha ayudado mucho en, en mi vida y, y, y yo sé que si se puede hacer eso para más personas, también les va a ayudar mucho. Mientras así, seguimos peleando para que el Congreso tenga una uh, protección eh, permanente para la comunidad. Y gracias, Erika. Y, y los que están viendo, si tienen preguntas, ahí puedo poner abajo. Por favor, compartir el video para que la gente pueda saber qué está pasando en Georgia, por qué es tan importante. Y, y también porque si la gente no... He escuchado de Erika, quiero que ellos escuchen muy bien. Erika Andiola es una persona que antes que existió DACA, no tenía un permiso de trabajo, nada. Ella tuvo que empujar y es una de las personas más responsables. Ella no va a decir, yo voy a tomar crédito, pero yo sí voy a decir que fue por las acciones de ella organizando al nivel nacional y internacional que empujaron el presidente hacer el programa de DACA. Si no fue por sus esfuerzos, si no fue por su energía, si no fue por el tiempo, el sacrificio que usted lo hizo, no íbamos a tener DACA. Eso yo lo puedo decir directamente en mi corazón con mucha confianza. So, eso es Erika Andiola, para aquellos que no saben. Y Erika, para los jóvenes que ya están viendo ahorita, que no pueden calificar por DACA porque son jóvenes todavía, que algo está pasando a sus papás, ¿Qué deben hacer ellos? ¿Dónde usted sacó esta energía, esta confianza para pelear cuando no había DACA? ¿Y qué deben hacer ellos ahorita para hacer esos tipos de cambios? Esto es bien importante. Es una pregunta muy importante porque lo que yo he aprendido durante todos los años que he estado haciendo este trabajo es que cuando una persona comparte su historia y enseña al resto del país Quién, quiénes somos como seres humanos, ¿no? Eh, que nos conocen, que saben que no, 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 no simplemente soy una persona indocumentada o como me llaman a veces, ¿no? Como nos llaman que son ilegales o los criminales o los, tú sabes, los, ya ni sé qué tanta cosa nos dicen. No nada más soy eso, sino que ahora muchas personas saben quién soy por nombre, ¿no? Que, que, que saben que tengo un nombre, que tengo una cara, que tengo una historia y... Lo que pasó cuando nosotros salimos de las sombras como jóvenes indocumentados fue que empezamos a cambiar la narrativa de inmigración, empezamos a cambiar la, las, las mentes, los corazones de la gente americana y que empezaron a ver que, que somos seres humanos, ¿no? Como ellos y que tal vez fuimos a las escuelas que fueron sus hijos, que estuvimos, eh, eh, que, que hemos hecho, que tenemos, que somos seres humanos más bien. Entonces, lo digo para... para invitar ¿no? a los jóvenes, invitar a los que no están tan jóvenes <ríe> para que también nos involucremos um, y que empecemos a, um, tal vez ahorita con Trump todavía hay miedo y yo lo entiendo y hasta que lo saquemos, hasta que esté allá metido en, en no sé dónde, en Florida o en Rusia, no sé a dónde se va a ir, hasta que eso pase, eh, todavía haber algo de miedo, pero cuando se pase ese miedo, ¿no? que podamos ya... Eh, ver que hay un presidente demócrata que ha estado corriendo en una plataforma pro inmigrante, que podamos tener esa um, courage, um, que, que podamos decir, 
no tenemos miedo salir otra vez a las calles a protestar, involucrarnos con organizaciones locales, como aquí en Arizona están las organizaciones como Lucha, como Puente, uh, como eh, tantas ¿no? que nosotros conocemos que están haciendo el trabajo por tantos años. Y ellos siempre están ahí para, para trabajar con la comunidad, para empoderarnos y para que podamos seguir eh, cambiando esa narrativa y, y enseñando quiénes realmente somos como seres humanos para que nos dejen de atacar. Y de esa forma vamos a, yo pienso que de esa forma vamos a poder empujar a personas como Biden a hacer lo, lo que han prometido hacer con, con, con nuestra comunidad en cuanto a la reforma migratoria o en cuanto a cambios de inmigración. A esta comunidad... Ya escucho de Erika, la doctora Maldonado dice, gracias por tu liderazgo, Erika, por tu corazón tan grande. Verle more a tu mami es una inspiración. Uh, gracias, doctora Maldonado. Dice también Marta, gracias por la información. Mi guerrera hermosa Erika Andiola, gracias. Siempre estamos con la comunidad, Marta, claro que sí. Muchas gracias por estar viéndonos aquí. Uh, so, Erika, amazing lady, pleasure and honor to hear her speak. Es, ya estamos en... Español haciendo cosas excelentes aquí, mm -hmm. escuchando a Erika, que nos está dando la energía a seguir peleando. Muchísimas gracias, Erika. Unas últimas cosas que usted quiere decir a la comunidad, no tiene que ser sobre Georgia o lo que sea, pero usted está muy involucrada. ¿Qué, qué es el último mensaje que usted quiere dar a la comunidad? Que no hemos terminado la, la batalla ni, ni la lucha. Eh, estamos, de hecho, esta es la parte donde nosotros tenemos que estar más involucrados como comunidad inmigrante, como una comunidad latina, y que este fue el primer paso, ¿no? Fue el primer paso para sacar a, a un racista de la Casa Blanca, a una persona que realmente estaba eh, atacándonos como, como inmigrantes, ¿no? Como latinos también, como personas de color. Eh, pero ahorita ya es, literalmente, ese es el momento para empezar a pensar cómo nosotros vamos a involucrarnos cómo vamos a poder nosotros uh, realmente asegurarnos que las promesas sean cumplidas. Y uh, tenemos que aprender de las lecciones que, que vimos bajo el presidente Obama, ¿no? Y eh, estaba compartiendo yo en, en, mi, en mi Facebook y en mi Instagram que mi mamá estaba muy, muy contenta cuando miro estas noticias. Y Rey y yo hemos estado trabajando ya por tantos años para... Para dejar, para dejar que, que mi mamá me dice quede aquí y no, que no la deporten. Y para mí, para ella, yo, yo empecé a llorar ¿no? cuando supe las noticias y, y lo primero que vino a mi mente es vamos a poder dejar aquí a mi mami en este país, que vamos a poder pelear más para que ella pueda quedarse en este país. Y yo sé que muchos de ustedes, muchos de nosotros tuvimos esa misma como pudimos respirar profundo por, por, por hace cuatro años que no respirábamos de esta manera. Eh, pero hay que dejar que esto nos dé más um, motivación para poder asegurarnos que personas como mi mamá, que personas como Lupita, que fueron deportadas, que, que podamos regresar a Lupita, que podemos dejar aquí a mi mamá, que podemos parar las deportaciones de más gente en nuestra comunidad. Y la, la lucha realmente comienza ahora. Entonces, no hay que, no hay que, sí, no, no, no hay que regresarnos a, a la normalidad para nada. Ahorita es donde empieza la lucha realmente. Ya festejamos, ya es tiempo, la lucha sigue, dice Aaron. Rom Rom, Erica has been such an inspiration. Uh, and thank you, Erica, for that inspiration, for your work, for your wisdom, for your words, and tonight for your time. Uh, really, really appreciate it. No, thank you, Ray, and thank you for everyone who was watching. Okay, nos vemos, comunidad, gracias.